Good morning, everybody. Uh, can I start by apologising for the slight delay in commencing today's proceedings and thanking you all for your patience. Uh, welcome to the launch of the State of the Service Roadshow. My name is Claire Walsh. I'm a Deputy Secretary uh, in the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and also will be your MC and facilitator today. Thank you um, very much both for those in the room, but we also have a really large number of people joining us online. I think we're at something like 5,500 people online, so that's a very impressive uh, engagement in what's a really important discussion for us in the public service. But before we talk any more, it's really my pleasure to invite Uncle Wally Bell to come and speak with us today. Uh, well, not speak to us, but actually to, to offer us a welcome to country. Can I offer, uh, invite you up onto the... Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm going to start off with um, one of our traditional practices. Um, the Ngunnawal people have several different clan groups. Uh, we move around a country a fair bit. And that's our way of looking after country, caring for country. Um, when we, during those movements, then we, we come across our other clan groups, of course, because we all don't live in the one place. We live in different areas around on country. But when we do meet up, uh, we carry out our greeting protocol. Um, so I'm going to say a word to you in, uh, in language, and you guys are going to say that word back to me. You ready? Yeah. Yuma. Yuma. That was a bit slack. <laughs> uh, can we try it one more time? Yuma. Yuma. Beautiful. Thank you. Now, that word in our language is uh, hello. Um, I'll tell you the other word that uh, I'll use maybe at the end uh, is uh, for goodbye, which is yara. Not yara, like the yara river. <laughs> yara. Alrighty. Um, for people that don't know me, my name's Wally Bell. I'm a Ngunnawal man. I've grown up here on country... Um, I started out in a little place, uh, well, I, I recently started out in Yass on, on a, a little reserve called Oak Hill. Um, then we moved out into a, another place called Jurawa. Uh, it's out there that I learned about being an Aboriginal person on country. It's one of our uh, traditional practices where our uh, senior people take us out on country and, and uh, teach us all about the place. Uh, I was privileged to have my dad do, do that with me. So he taught me all about uh, uh, bush foods, bush medicines, uh, how to source food on country, and most importantly, where to, where to source water. You know, water doesn't always run in streams. Um, that teaching then is, has put me where I am today. I'm uh, 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 probably what you call a knowledge holder for my people. So I, I do a lot of, a lot of cultural awareness work uh, where I take people out on country and and just tell them about the place. Uh, teach them how we survived for so long on country. Um, also, I do a lot of cultural heritage uh, management work as well, and that's to protect our culture on country as well. That's um, my main role at the moment um, because there's so much development taking place and it does impact on our culture, uh, you know. When, when you get told by uh, people in authority that... Uh, we're losing Australia-wide at least 50 uh, cultural sites a day. Uh, it, it's a big impact on, on Aboriginal culture Australia-wide. Um, I also sit on a lot of um, boards and committees. Um, one of my favourite ones is uh, Landcare ACT. Now, through them, I, I do a lot of cultural, cultural awareness works. Um, I teach people about country and, and what to look for on country when... They're out there doing their wonderful works, uh, you know, re getting rid of weeds and rubbish and all that sort of stuff and, and replanting so that that process in, in itself can impact on our culture if people don't know what, they're, um, what to look for. So I teach them all about, uh, you know, stone arrangements, burial sites and things like that so they don't impact those areas. Um, what else do I do? That's about it, I guess. Um, oh, I, I show people about 
some of our traditional land uh, management practices. Uh, one of those things, of course, is uh, uh, cool burning. So it, it's quite important that people understand who we are as a people and, and how we look after our country that we live on. Um, where do I go from here? Um, our, our group then, the Nonawa people, uh, we've occupied this region for at least uh, 25,000 years, which has been scientifically dated, so it, you know, that's, that's just to give uh, a scientific element to it all. But uh, we, we know we've been here a bit longer than that. We come, moved in uh, when the Ice Age uh, moved away as well. So that was about 35,000 years ago, so there's a little bit of leeway in there. Um, we occupy an area of something like 17,000 square kilometres. Um, due to my cultural uh, works that I do, uh, I can say I've seen a fair bit of that country. I don't think I'll ever get to see it all. There's some places that are just inaccessible. Um, the Nunawa people, then, as I said, we do have different clan groups. Um, you know, there's about seven different clan groups. And clan groups, if, if you didn't realise, are, are basically different family groups that, 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 uh, of, our, of the Nunawa people. So that means then that um, we have uh, <laughs> a bureaucracy, I guess you'd call it. So that, that's um, uh, where we operate on, in, in those family groups, clan groups, as, uh, uh, under communal law, LAW sort of stuff. Now, as, as um, uh, Aboriginal people, you know, part of the Aboriginal population of Australia, we also have to operate under the traditional customary law. That's L-O-R-E stuff. So as Aboriginal people then, we get our customs and our belief systems from the place that we live in. So that's, that's um, to put it into perspective, um, what we do here on Nunawa country is going to be quite different uh, to our neighbouring groups, for instance, the Yuan people. So here on Nunawa country, we've got land and you know, big hills. But down on the, on the eastern side of our, our country, um, the Yuan people have land and ocean. So that's going to tell you straight away that uh, customary practice is going to be quite different. Um, you know, different environments, so um, different, different ways of doing stuff. That's going to be quite evident if you go into central Australia. You know, the Arente people, they're going to have um, different ways of doing stuff because they've got desert. So as compared to here, so, you know, practice is going to be quite different all around Australia. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> um, one of the things, though, that under the traditional customary law uh, that we all abide by uh, Australia-wide as Aboriginal people is uh, a welcome to country. Now, a welcome to country is where we welcome visitors to our country, onto country, um, to make you feel comfortable while you're here. Our, um, our people, the Nunawal, we do it in, with slight variations. But uh, my, my clan group, the Ya, uh, come from the area around Yas. We not only uh, welcome you onto country, but we also offer you a protection while you're here as well. So we're going to look after you in a physical sense and we're going to look after you in a spiritual sense. The physical part's going to be taken care of by what we call our spirit of the land. So that means that uh, as you're actually treading foot on country, walking around on, on Nunawal country, the uh, spirit of the land will then look up and look out for you to make sure that nothing really bad physically happens to you. The other part of that is that as Aboriginal people, uh, our strongest belief is that we all come from the land. We're put here in a physical sense to look after the place, to care for country. And when our time is up, we go back to the land. So um, we're going to ask our past generations that have already gone through that process, that, who now reside in the land itself, to look after you in a spiritual, spiritual sense. Because our belief systems tell us that there's bad spirit out on country as well. Now, that's something you can't see or touch, but it does affect everything. Like everybody here at the moment, uh, you've got your own personal auras, and that's something you carry with you all the way through your life. 
And you know at times you don't feel that good, you know, something on the downside, you know, sick, sad and all that sort of stuff. That's because there's bad spirit out there that, you, you know, you can't see and touch it, but it has a tendency to latch onto your auras and, and do something to you on the, on the downside. So we're going to ask our ancestral spirits to remove any bad spirit that might be present. But to be able to do that, uh, I've got to make sure they know I'm here welcoming you guys on the country uh, and looking after you while you're here. So I'm going to make a little bit of noise and call for those spirits to come and join me. My noise is going to be done through the use of uh, clapsticks. Okay, um, now then, my, my being a normal man, and uh, I, I'm out on country a lot, so I have a really strong bond with my, my country. But I can tell that those spirits have now joined us. Hopefully you can feel their presence as well. As I said then, spirit of the land will now look after you as you walk around on country, make sure that nothing really bad happens to you physically. At this very moment, our ancestral spirits are going around to everybody present, looking at your auras making sure there's no bad spirit that might be attached to it. But if they do find that stuff, they just grab hold of it. Toss it off country, get rid of it. Something we don't want here. We don't want to affect you as a person, and we certainly don't want it to affect the land that you're on. The spirits then ask that you do two things while you're on country. First one, the important one, respect this place that you're in. You've got to look after it, care for it, as we have now done for thousands of years. Second thing they want you to do is also to respect and be kind and courteous to other people that you meet while you're on country. So if you do these two things for us, the spirits will then harmonise with your stay on Donnerwall country. So may the spirits be with you today, tomorrow and for always. I'll just close off with some words in language. Dalawanunna, Dalawanunoi. Yangu nalawari dunamayan, nalaganawale. Yomalonde. This land is not all land. We all come together today for this grand occasion. Welcome. John Yamaba. Yara. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Uncle Wally, and I've had the great privilege of being welcomed to countries many times uh, by you, and I always learn uh, much from that, so we really do genuinely appreciate that. Can I also acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders that are with us here in the, in the theatre or joining us online? Okay, a quick overview of uh, today's proceedings. We're very fortunate to have Senator the Honourable uh, Katie Gallagher here, who is the Minister for the Public Service. Um, and after she's spoken with us, we will follow that with a panel discussion, uh, which of course will include any questions you may have. So again, I encourage you to start submitting those via um, Slido. And the QR code is there at the moment, so please take your mobile out, scan the code, and uh, you can Actually, if that doesn't work, use the URL that's also on the screen. Now, while we have Slido up, we would like to start off with a few little trivia questions. For those of you who are on site, if the technology works, you should see the first question now. 
There's 20 seconds on the clock. Uh, and before we show the right answer, so quick smart, what do you think is the most popular male name in the Australian Public Service? <laughs> and there it is, Michael it is. So for any Michaels in the room, you're very common. <laughs> All right. What is the most popular female name in the APS? Hmm. I think this might be closely correlated to the question about the age of the APS. How are we going? All right. Hey, you guys are good. All right. Final question. So this might be a clue based on those names, but what is the average age of an APS employee? Sadly, I'm not in this demographic. Okay, what do we think? Do we get this one right? Is it a three out of three? Oi! There you go. Senator, see how smart we are in the APS? Three out of three. There we go. Well done, everybody. Um, now, it's now my pleasure to actually invite uh, Senator Gallagher to the, the stage. It says here, of course, that she is the uh, Minister for the Public Service, but of course you have at least two other portfolios, a little one called Finance, um, which is, can't be very busy at the moment, um, and of course uh, the portfolio for women as well, really important three portfolio uh, responsibilities, and so we really do appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today, and please come up to the stage. Uh, thanks so much, Claire, for that welcome. And can I also acknowledge um, Uncle Wally? Thank you very much for your really wonderful welcome to country this morning. Uh, very warm and generous. And um, I acknowledge and pay my respects uh, to the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners of this land. Um, and I thank them very much uh, for their custodianship and care for country. I also extend that respect to any other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us here or online today. And I'm very proud to be part of a government who has committed to implement, implement the Uluru Statement from the Heart in full, including constitutional recognition, a voice to our national parliament, treaty and truth. Can I also acknowledge Public Service Commissioner Peter Woolcott and other senior leaders from the APS today. Thank you to the panellists. Thankfully for me, I'm not staying for question time. I figure I get enough of that in the Senate, um, but it's a really important opportunity uh, for uh, public servants right across the country to hear from uh, some of our leaders and on their perspectives. I also understand there's 300 graduates from the 2023 APS Graduate Development Program who are tuning in from Old Parliament House this morning. Thousands of people online. I did ask if you were all being made to join online, but I'm assured that it's voluntary. And um, there's a small but mighty, a modest and mighty crowd here in Canberra. So I'm here to launch uh, the State of the Service Roadshow series, and I see that it's going to go on a roadshow, travelling around the country over the coming weeks. I think this is a real opportunity to reflect on 2022 to understand all of the latest data and our knowledge of the APS and to discuss where the public service needs to head to meet some of those challenges that we're all working on in the future. And it's a real privilege for me to have this role, to be Minister for the Public Service and an amazing opportunity to work with you all to ensure that the enduring institution of the APS, shaped over more than a century, is protected and strengthened and able to form the role that our democracy and the people of Australia rely upon. So you've all chosen to work as a public servant. It is indeed an honourable profession, 
a profession that's often misrepresented in lazy language from politicians who should know better but can't help the cheap headline. But those of us that know, that work closely with the APS, see the hard-working, problem-solving, creative thinking, technical experts, national leaders in your fields, the smartest, dedicated servants of the public. And when I look ahead, I know the APS has to adapt to the changing world around us. Perhaps this has always been the case, but the change that's coming our way seems to be coming at a pace. And despite all these challenges that that brings, it provides us with enormous opportunity to adapt, to adopt and utilise new technologies to help us work, to evaluate what is being done to make sure it's delivering the outcomes sought and to drive efficiencies so we can reinvest in growing areas of demand and meet community need. That's the finance minister part of my brain working there. I can see exciting jobs where we're retaining staff and employing new ones, where we offer flexibility and great opportunities so that people want to work in the APS, in jobs we probably haven't even thought of yet. So this is an important time to get moving, to prepare, to equip, to equip the APS, and in order to do that, we need to. And in order to do that, I say we need everyone pulling in the same direction. Many of you will hopefully have heard of the work that's underway the APS reforms. The 2021-22 State of the Service report highlights the beginnings of the work we are doing to build a fit-for-purpose, trusted and capable APS. The information in it helps inform our reform agenda, which focuses on four key pillars. Uh, an APS that embodies e integrity in everything it does, that puts people and businesses at the centre of policy and services, is a model employer, and has the capability to do its job well. I think this roadshow and um, the discussions today will give you all an opportunity to explore some of these reform areas, to examine the data collected through the census and some of the other trends that show in the report, and allow a local look at it all. Um, I was really pleased to see the number of places that the roadshow is going, because we know that not everything happens in Canberra. I think this is a really important and hopefully people will find time to engage in these opportunities to help shape the future of the APS. And there is some really pleasing information coming out of the latest report. If you indulge me as the Minister for Women, I strongly believe that the APS should be leading the way on reaching gender equality and in many ways the inf information in the latest report shows good progress has been made in this area. For example, the APS has achieved overall gender balance at most senior leadership levels for the first time. Women make up 52% of the SES. However, there is still more work to be done to obtain parity at bands two and three levels. Female representation in the APS in 2022 is at 60.4%. And on the gender pay gap, it continues to close and is way below the national average gender pay gap. It was 6% in December 2021, down from 6.6 .6 the previous year. So we're on the right track, but there's still some ground to cover to completely co close the gap. And I'm really pleased that more work is being done to understand the reasons behind the gap as it exists now. And this will give us the ability to close it. This year will be the first year where APS agencies will be required to report to the workplace gender equality agencies, as we have been asking the private sector to do for many years. And this is an important step, and I'm really glad it's happening this uh, now. The government has set an ambitious target to increase First Nations people's employment in the APS to 5% by 2030. We have some way to go here. The percentage of First Nations people across the public service wo workforce remains at 3.5% without much movement in recent years. We know that First Nations employees have shorter APS careers and higher separation rates which are concerning and need special attention at understanding this and ensuring we are doing what we can to retain and attract First Nations employees. The APS must provide genuine opportunities to build rewarding careers and have visible and influential APS leaders in this regard. On cultural diversity more broadly, it's really important that the APS embraces and supports a culturally and linguistically diverse workforce to reflect the community we serve. In 2022, almost a quarter of APS employees were recorded as being born outside of Australia, with Western Australia, Victoria and New South Wales all having over 25% of employees born overseas, and 23.2% speak a first language other than English. It's clear there is more work to do to increase the representation of First Nations and called employees, 
within the senior levels of the APS. And I really welcome the work that will be done this year to support culturally and linguistically diverse and First Nations employees participating in the new APS Academy EL2 continuous professional development program as one of the practical ways to bridge the gap to the SES. To better understand employee experiences at work, this year's APS employee census will capture further information on cultural background of respondents. Obviously, the more people that participate in that, the better, uh, when this year's census runs in late May or early June. So I encourage everyone to get involved. I feel like I'm talking probably to, um, to the crowd that already does that. We will ask for your engagement and feedback as we move to include stewardship as the new APS value in the Public Service Act. Collaboration across the service and with the public will follow to establish a purpose statement for the APS. This will unite the service and support you to connect to your role as stewards of the APS. The feedback the public shares with us about us and how they rate our work should be visible to all Australians. That's why we've published the Survey of Trust in Australian Public Services Annual Report. We're continuing to promote an open APS, one where genuine partnerships are actively sought out and encouraged with external organisations and communities. The state of the service gives us a lot of data points. How big the APS is, part-time, full-time work, 80% full-time, in case you're wondering, it was a bit higher than I thought. The diversity data, which I've gone through a bit before, age breakdown, classification breakdown, we now know names and the average age. And it's all collected and put into nifty tables for people like me to get my head around quickly. Through the census and other sources, I'm keeping a close eye on how the APS fosters respectful workplaces and an inclusive culture with integrity at the core. I'm pleased to see the APS employee census respondents continue to report lower levels of bullying and harassment. There has been a drop from 17.4% in 2012 to 9.2% in 2022. But this is still way too high and we hear about pockets of um, negative workplace culture across the APS. I hear about it pretty regularly from time to time, over the, usually at the supermarket at Dixon Woolworths. Um, it's even uh, higher for First Nations employees and employees uh, with a disability. So this is something that we are keeping our eye on. We will re be requiring the publishing of all census results as a way of ensuring we are providing and sharing information and ensuring that agencies are taking action where problems are identified. Now, I've talked a fair bit since taking on this role about making sure the APS has the capability to do its job well as part of the reform agenda. This will take time to re-establish after many years of eroding capability, but I am committed to getting it done. Now, this doesn't just mean employing more people, although in some cases it is needed, and you saw some of our response on that in the October budget. It's also about working differently, reprioritising within agencies and making the best use of staff already available. We're looking to develop an operating model for an in-house consulting function, which some of you may heard of, have heard about. Now, this will not replace the use of consultants, but I'm hoping it will strengthen core capabilities and functions. And I would like to see a reduction in the use of consultants overall. The Capability Reinvestment Fund opened late last year as part of APS reform and has received a number of proposals that respond to a number of systemic challenges the APS faces. I look forward to having more to say about that soon. Evaluation, also an important capability the government would like to enhance. We must be in better shape to evaluate and assess the programs we deliver now and the programs that we will establish in the future. Evaluation hasn't been a big part of the public policy process in this country, and that needs to change if we're going to be the efficient, effective and trusted APS relied upon by the Australian community, and also if we're going to be able to afford to do all the things that we need to do. Before I finish, I would just like to briefly touch on APS bargaining. Um, we're try we are genuinely trying to do things differently here uh, to how it's been done before. We want to engage uh, with our employees and through their representatives, through the unions. Uh, we want to genuinely bargain. Um, now, I've been around this clock a few times, so I do know that it's not all going to be smooth sailing um, and there will be times that we disagree, but I can assure you that the government wants to work with you as a model employer to reach agreement and affordable wage increases um, and improvements to conditions where we can and settle those agreements as soon as possible. We don't want to draw it out 
and we are genuinely at the table. We have put resources behind a bargaining team um, led by the Commission. Uh, that work is underway uh, and I know there will be some bumps but I am genuinely hoping we can move through that reasonably quickly. So in conclusion, um, there is much going on across the APS. Aside from APS reform, you've all got your um, day jobs to do. We are a demanding government in the sense that we want to get things done. We do want to make a difference and I think you can see that right across all portfolios and across the Cabinet. For me in my role as Minister for the APS, we will work to tackle the challenges identified in many reports, Thody, but also the information we can glean from the State of the Service report by getting on with the reform work, by investing in our people and improving capability, by grabbing the opportunities that come with new technology and through all that building an APS for the future. Integrity, focused on the people it serves, a model employer, attracting and retaining the best and the brightest with the capability to do its job that we need it to do, to deliver 21st century outcomes through new ways of working and innovation. So not much really to achieve, but we can only achieve this with your buy-in and help through the important work that you all do. So thank you for the opportunity to launch the Roadshow today and have this opportunity just to give you, say, a few remarks. I, I really look, um, cherish this part of my job um, and I look forward to working together to protect and strengthen the APS. Thanks very much. Sorry, I meant to say that at the end. That's why I'm going to go this way. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much, Senator, and, and uh, we really do appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> All right. Now, today in the room we have Debbie Wood. Can someone... Where's Debbie? Hi. Right at the back there. Hi, Debbie. How are you going? Debbie is a visual scribe. I didn't know we'd had those people, but it's great to meet you and see more about what you do, which is fantastic. So what Debbie's doing is creating a picture summary of this event, and here we are at the beginning of that uh, picture, um, and so we're looking forward, Debbie, to coming back at the end of the uh, session to see how this image um, has evolved. So as uh, Minister Gala has said, the State of the Service Roadshow is an annual occasion where we come together and talk through ideas for the public service and also an opportunity to share stories and experience. Uh, this, the APSC is capturing some of those stories and I want to take the opportunity to show a bit of a trailer of some of the stories that have been captured so far. My name is Leanne. I'm based in Canberra. I work at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. And this is my story. Hello, my name is Ben. My name is Sanam Safar. My name is Hannah. My name is Muhammad Al Abri. I'm Grant Nicholson. My name is Robin Evans. My name is Andrew Feinstein. Hey there, my name is Belle Hogg. My name is Megan Kopatz, and this is my APS story. So I got to uh, talk to different agencies, see inside. Uh, their cultures and their initiatives and what they were doing and I thought wow there's so much going on in the APS I, I really need to uh, broaden my horizons. Starting out in service delivery taking calls from Australians who were unemployed and hearing some stories that broke my heart and that really started off a very um, rewarding time being able to help the Australian public and that hasn't changed um, there's plenty of opportunity around now. They've got some, a thing called the a development register that if you're interested in developing your career and working your way up from maybe as a team leader. I continue to learn and share all around government uh, through the amazing communities that, that I've been involved with. Um, there's a, um, a thing called the Digital Profession and I'm running a visual scribing community. So um, we have local, state, federal, all kinds of um, different government agencies, departments um, that come together. The advice that I would give to people is um, do experience uh, time in other organisations. It's well worth it to uh, uh, expand your horizons and to go and, and spend time discovering what other agencies do and, 
and sharing your talent around. But at the same time, if, you, if you're comfortable in the organisation you are, you can, you're adding value there, there is value for the organisation in you staying for a period of time in the organisation. Bring like-minded people together. We share webinars, we bring in speakers, and we hold events like both swaps. The next big event we're trying to hold is an APS-wide uh, event for Clean Up Australia Day on the 5th of March, 2023. We hope to see you there. I started up their neurodiversity network, which grew to 400 members in one year. And I was super thrilled that the ATO supported me in co-founding their network. And so we decided to bring people together for a bit of a meeting just to explore what it was that agencies were already doing, what they were maybe aware of, what they thought were opportunities, what they really wanted to learn. So we kind of wanted to have this exploratory meeting just to, I guess, gauge the level of interest and maturity, if you will, right, with, with neurodiversity awareness and inclusion across the APS. So there was so much support because I was at the learning stage, people were there to support me, help me, gave me like the network and development opportunities, but within APS6 is something I have to find on my own. Um, but it's really amazing and challenging for me because this, this was something I was looking for that where I can challenge myself, get out of the comfort zone and uh, maybe an inspiration for others. My highlight was definitely the evaluation workshop I led because it directly led to the APC changing its HR processes in a meaningful way. So I thought it was very impactful. My key takeaway from this whole experience work on the project is that each and every person has the power to create change. Thank, thank you to the APSC for putting that together. That's a great little video and uh, I reckon we could all get some tips on Drew's tailor. That's an awesome suit and tie he was wearing. Um, okay, so we're going to move now into our panel discussion and uh, a reminder of the Slido question panel opportunities. So here we are up on the screen again. It really is fantastic, these uh, panel events, if we can be responding to the questions that you have. Uh, so please, um, I encourage you to do that. Now, it's my great honour to introduce our panellists. Uh, please join me on stage. Uh, Peter Woolcott, AO, who is the Australian Public Service Commissioner and I think well known to most of us. Do you want to come up? Uh, Ray Griggs, AOCSC, who is the Secretary of the Department of Social Services. Jodie Brown, who is the CEO of the National Indigenous Australians Agency. And Rachel Bacon, who's the Deputy Secretary of Public Sector Reform at PMNC. Thank you all for joining me today. And Peter, I think I might have started on that glass. If you want to. <laughs> Don't worry. Um, so thanks for joining me today, and I'm just going to join you at the end. best share the unique skills and perspectives of each generation when working together? And I wonder, Ray, if I could ask you to have a go at that question first, because I imagine in your department in particular, you have a very wide demographic. We do, but I'm probably going to be a bit contrarian, unfortunately, uh, in the sense that um, workforce segmentation is an enduring feature of any workforce, uh, whether it's segmenting by generations or people's experience. When I, when I joined the Navy in 1978, um, I was still at school, I joined the Navy Reserve, so you had people in the organisation who were at school, right through to people who were World War II vets. So the segmentation in that workforce was about their experience, you know, which conflict they'd served in. So. You know, I, I think I think we maybe overdo the generational bit 
a little too much because uh, for me it's all about understanding your workforce. If you don't understand who's in your workforce, you, you won't be able to effectively communicate, you won't be able to lead, you won't be able to inspire. So I think it's really important to understand those differences, but not just, not just from which generation they might be from. Uh, I think it's particularly important in terms of internal communications, um, how you, uh, you know, how you most effectively engage people, and th there are clear differences between those five generations that you talked about, about how they like to be engaged, what is actually going to work in terms of communicating. So I'm not, I'm not trying to diss the issue of, of the generations, but it's no different in my sense it, to people who like to absorb their information visually or in prose, or, you know. So I think um, if, people are, if people are authentically led, if they're well led, if they're valued and they're respected, uh, I don't think it matters what their sort of segmentation is. Um, that's what we really need to be aiming for. Thank you. I wonder, Jody, from your perspective on that question. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, and Wandiwa, everyone. Um, great to see so many people interested in, in the sector and great to see you all here. And I think that diversity I can see just in this room, but I know there will also be diversity in all the, the viewers online as well. Um, so thanks, you all. I mean, I think uh, to Ray's point, um, that uh, is my, uh, to me it is about valuing and respecting the difference that we have in our workplace and what everyone brings is that unique quality to the workplace and, um, and to me uh, age is really only just one of those factors and I, I would hope that you appreciate the diversity right across the workplace, across, across all of those factors um, and, and not stereotype people into, uh, in, into the sectors because it, or, or segments if you like. Uh, because people are all individuals and they'll have their own way of, of needing to be led. And as, as Ray was pointing out, I think um, we can't just box people in and say, oh, that's how we need to do, deal with this part of our workplace. And uh, at NIAA, uh, we have um, a very diverse workforce uh, and I have to say both on age and every other quality uh, who bring a lot of their life experience to the work and make a huge difference and, and a huge com contribution uh, from their in individual backgrounds, and that's I think that I think that's really important. So that value and respect for people's differences is so important, and um, that does mean you need to be able to adjust and you need to be able to respond differently to what people want. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about flexibility uh, 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 later in the in the discussion. But I think it's just uh, really about that value and respect for that individual difference is so important. Thanks for that. And just um, I'm going to ask. Peter and, and Rachel to also uh, chime in on this question, but maybe if I can ask you to take it from a slightly different angle, which is picking up your point there. Um, Jody. while, you know, both of our speakers, Ray and, and Jody, have said not to get too caught up with segmenting people, putting people in uh, boxes based on age or any other kind of segment, but do you see in the work that you do differences, genuine differences in expectations? And I'm thinking about this flexible work, uh, you know, conversation that we're all in at the moment um, because that flexible work means different things to different people obviously and partly that's about age and where you are in your life and your career but there's more to it I suspect but Peter can I invite you sure <coughs> sure thanks um Claire for that uh look I, I think I very much agree with some points have been made but um we are, and I thought that, that uh, the data that went up there about uh, the average age of our workforce was just really interesting because we're now 43 as an average age. And that just shows we're a maturing workforce. And so uh, I also see the public service as almost, when we talk about the academy, we talk about craft and the craft of being a public servant. And it's almost like a lifelong apprenticeship. If you're young, you're bringing in certain new, fresh skills. You're certainly very comfortable with the digital age, with data, the fast pace of of the world. But again, if you're old, you've been through, older like myself, and you've been through the system, um, you, you, you picked up a lot of networks which are vitally important to be a good public servant. You picked up a lot of what I might call guile in terms of how you do your business, how you, how you influence people, how you influence outcomes. So what you want is those, you, and we've got a big demographic challenge with an ageing workforce, and that's just right across Australia. You want to have that balance. You want to have that diversity in any team or group. 
So you want to have your young, fresh ideas coming through. You're going to challenge the way you think, the way you do things. But you're still going to want to have that experience and guile in the system as well. So to me, there's it's five generations. But there's some big challenges there in terms of... Uh, you raised about the issue of different approaches to flexible, flexible work. If you're young, um, obviously you've got... Um, you might be starting a family, you've got different, different, different priorities there. But if you're old, you've got aging parents, you've got all those issues to manage as well. So flexibility is pretty fundamental as a way of making sure that workforce is, is able to sort of be content uh, and, and to also deliver for government. But uh, big challenges around a maturing workforce and the five generations thing is just part of that challenge. Rachel, did you want to... Um, offer a perspective on this question? Sure, thanks Claire. Um, and I might give just a bit more of a personal uh, perspective. I really agree, Peter, with your point about lifelong apprenticeship. Uh, I'm still doing my apprenticeship in the APS um, uh, and still learning. When I first joined the APS, uh, as an, uh, I was an APS 5 when I started, uh, and my supervisor was 30 years older than me. Um, and Peter, what you're saying around just the ability to learn from someone's corporate knowledge, um, she had so many stories uh, about what it was like in the public service, you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. People used to smoke in the office with an ashtray on their desk, you know, <laughs> that was issued. Um, things had changed quite a lot uh, even when I'd started. Um, but my personal reflection on that um, is that uh, the thing that really um, kind of uh, helped us have quite a special relationship where I could learn from all her corporate knowledge and she was incredibly interested in my perspectives and my ideas. Um, and so that kind of love of ideas um, and that love of learning, uh, almost a lifelong love of learning, we, we had a, a really shared um, thing in common. Um, and 25 years later, she is one of my dearest friends still. Um, but that, that very personal experience for me, um, I think just... Uh, highlighted, you know, that apprenticeship approach. We are always learning um, wherever we are uh, in a lifelong apprenticeship. If we're kind of open-minded about it, um, we can really gain a huge amount from the different perspectives of people that we might not otherwise interact with or meet unless we meet them at work. Thanks. Thank you, um, Rachel. My second question, I'm going to start this time with Peter, if that's OK. Uh, the Minister spoke to us about the APS uh, reform agenda that the government has underway at the moment. So um, to each of the panellists, but as I said, starting with you, Peter, what has already been implemented or, or what changes do you expect will occur to build a stronger APS that's very focused on outcomes for community? As the Minister said, um, act as a model employer and contribute to a fairer and more inclusive Australia? A very broad question, so I invite you to take whichever slice of that you might wish to. Yeah, look, look. thanks again, Claire. And, I mean, I could speak for the next two hours <laughs> on, on, on this topic, but I won't. I'll, I'll try to be very, very, very succinct. Um, we are in the process of really, in a way, focused on one APS. That's where we're going. That's, that's actually what was in Terry Moran's report. It was, it was very fundamental to Thodia's, Thodia's review as well. Uh, that concept of pull, pulling together the public service as one APS, uh, just because of the complexity and interconnectedness of issues. Then there are lots of things that come through that as well about the in, in integrity of the system, the capability of the system, um, how, how you're a model employer. Uh, all these things are fundamental too, but they they come in in a, in a way to me under the rubric of that one APS structure because just the sheer complexity of issues, and we saw during COVID that the APS actually responded, I think, very well in managing the COVID um, the, the COVID issue through acting as as one integrated uh, integrated body, and that, that's that's pretty fundamental. Um, but if you look at the things we're looking at, they we're looking at uh, capability. That's a, we set up the academy, uh, at the focus on craft, which I talked about briefly. Um, you talk about the whole concept of continuous learning, and that again comes back to the to the apprenticeship idea as well as as well, well as more formal structured learning. You you, you look at uh, the way we set up professions and how we how we're trying to manage the whole. Um, the, the speed at which technology is moving and how it can be much more citizen-facing. You talk about uh, the use of data and integrating data, which we did with COVID, and how we need to do that for the future and evaluation. 
talk about partnerships and the whole concept of, um, of actually being much better at working with the public, working with business, working with trade unions, working with First Nations people. And what is genuine partnership? Which is something we haven't quite cracked uh, in the past, but we're going to need to go into the future. Um, there's all the issues around integrity, which I won't go into now, but happy to sort of take questions later on. And then, of course, the, the model employee aspects as well. Uh, so I might just stop there, because it's such a huge agenda. I'm happy to pick it apart with, the, with questions later, but might just begin there. And, of course, we work very closely with Rachel and the, and, and the Reform Office in the Prime Minister and Cabinet, and Gordon de Brow there, in driving a really... Uh, uh, really what you might call accelerated reform agenda. Reform is always part of our lives, but it is at, ex at an accelerated pace at the moment. Thanks, Peter. And maybe, Rachel, I'll, I'll throw to you and pick up where Peter's just left off. When we talk about reform, sometimes, sometimes we think about reform as we need to fix something. That's not always the case. Sometimes we're responding to changing circumstances around us and we're evolving through reform. So I'm interested in your perspective with the work that you're doing every single day on this agenda. Yeah, thanks, Claire. And, Peter, your comments about an accelerated agenda resonate with me. <laughs> We've got a lot on. Um, but uh, one of my main takeouts from listening to Minister Gallagher and how she talks about APS reform is really, I think, what the government uh, has given us collectively as a service is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to really stretch um, and, and do that uh, real uh, improvement. We're always doing continuous improvement, but they've given us a, a kind of... Uh, they've asked us to do a stretch goal. So um, in terms of uh, some of the things we're doing on the reform agenda, uh, as Peter said, it is very uh, diverse and broad reaching. Uh, you heard the minister talk about a few things today, but just a couple of things I might highlight. Um, one of them I'm super excited about. I think it's a really cool thing that we've been able to do. Uh, we've gone out through the coup, so the chief operating officers uh, in the coup committee. They come together on a regular basis. We met just yesterday. But what we've done, um, and Claire's on that group as well, what we've done is we've gone out to each portfolio um, and on the question of capability, which is a really important part of taking the opportunity um, to really think about how we want to lift our capability across the service, we've gone out to every single portfolio and we've actually asked, what are your areas of, of specialist capability and how might you be able to share them across the service? Um, and the, the data we've got back is incredible. We've got over 250 identified areas of specialist expertise that portfolios say we're happy to share, whether it's kind of in a light touch way, if you need to reach out for a 20 minute phone call because you're doing something new you haven't done before, we've done a lot of that thing, um, or in a heavy touch way, like with the in-house consulting model that we're working on developing and, and um, to take advice back to the minister on that she mentioned, um, there's some amazing capability right across the service uh, that we're thinking about how do we take a networked approach to that capability? How do we draw on it, for example, in an in-house consulting model um, in a way where we can actually leverage uh, and share across the service as one service um, uh, the fantastic capability um, that people have built and, and share it more broadly. Um, so there's some really exciting, very practical things that we're doing um, as part of the, the reform agenda, um, and that's just kind of one little bit. Um, the only other thing I'll mention quickly, uh, to the point of um, putting people and business at the centre of everything that we do in the service, both in terms of uh, service delivery, but in terms of also uh, implementing and designing policy in the first place. Um, the secretaries have established a new partnerships um, subcommittee of secretaries board. Um, Ray and Jody are actually uh, chairing that committee. Uh, but it's really uh, looking at how can we as a service lift our capability um, in kind of the ways that we engage with people, uh, with communities, with businesses, uh, what tools can we use to do that well, whether they're digital tools um, or other ways of doing that well? Um, and then how do we actually apply that um, to live challenges, often very complex challenges that we're dealing with across the service right now? So having you know, um, a group of secretaries, uh, uh, the top, some of our top leaders in the service, thinking about how can we do that better and give our people the authorising environment to go and engage and genuinely partner, um, I think is a really exciting opportunity as part of the agenda. 
Thanks, Rachel. Maybe, Jody, I can get you to pick up on that point there and, and the second part of the question in particular, that issue about better outcomes for community, Yeah. Um, which is something obviously that you're very focused on. Yeah, yeah thanks, Claire. I mean, um, people will know that uh, all governments signed up to the Closing the Gap uh, National Partnership Agreement. And that means that as a sector, uh, we've got a lot of work to do to uh, implement the priority reforms in that agreement. Uh, one of those is about working in partnership and genuine, genu genuine decision making with uh, uh, First Nations peoples. And I think there's a whole capability piece in that, uh, in terms of how do you do those effective partnerships, how do you have uh, strong relationships uh, and... and um, so, so with uh, Ray and I chairing the partnership committee, that's obviously a big uh, subcommittee. <laughs> it's obviously a big part of that. Um, and the work of NIAA is, uh, I suppose, much closer to that on the, on the ground. And so some best practice around how do you do and build those partnerships? What do they look like? What do genuine partnerships look like? And in fact, um, it's interesting, we've got a, a, a partnership uh, working group this afternoon uh, with the Coalition of Peaks uh, where... Uh, one of the agenda items is always around how, how do we improve the partnership, how do we uh, do a health check on the partnership across the partners. Um, so that's all the jurisdictions and all the coalition of peaks and what does that look like and how could we get better, what are the, what are the key elements of a successful partnership and what does that look like. So all of those things are really important. But how do we embed that capability in the rest of the sector as well? It can't be just NIAA doing that work. We do expect people to work in that way uh, and building those partnerships um, uh, across the sector in whatever department you're in. Um, so, so it's really important that we're involved in that work and leading that work. But um, uh, it's really about the outcomes for community and working and putting community at the centre. Um, and that's always been, I suppose, the work way that we've we've worked. Uh, but what does that look like? Um, and I suppose we've got lots of examples of where that uh, could be improved and we need to get out there and do better in that space as well. And every part of the sector as well should look at how they're responding to community and individuals um, so that they're getting the best possible service they can. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, okay. and, and Ray, you'll have a perspective on this. Yeah, I, I think um, from my perspective, it's less about the initiatives themselves, but... Uh, our readiness for it, and I think a lot of that comes down to organisational culture. And one of the things that I've been been working hard on in DSS is uh, is a culture that uh, I think sort of enables us to be ready for the reform that we need to to go through. Um, and there are, there are four things for me that are hugely important as trays in a in an organisational culture that that sort of enable uh, it to be adaptive. And they are um, curiosity. Uh, people do need to be curious. They don't need to accept the status quo. They need to challenge it. Contestability, um, a contest of ideas is so important uh, in what we do. Um, and not just the, the ability to respectfully challenge and contest, but the expectation that you, you will have your ideas challenged and contested and that you want to have your ideas challenged and contested because you're going to get a richer outcome um, as a result. Collaboration is, is clearly something, and not just collaboration across your department, but a, across uh, all of your stakeholders, uh, and courage. And I think you know, recent events uh, really underscore the fact that we've got to have courage as public servants. And I think those those are the four things that I prize in, in DSS. Uh, and I think when you put those together, uh, not in a formal cultural change program, because I'm, I, I've, I've lived through formal cultural change programs and, um, you know, sometimes they're very good, uh, often they're not. And for me, the best sort of cultural change is, is, the, is the cultural change that creeps up on people and they go, Oh wow, we actually have moved, we have shifted, and these are the these are the sort of four key principles for me that I think will help us uh, really really adapt to the reform challenge that lies ahead. Thanks for that. And if I um, can take the liberty in offering another two C's to your four, um, which I talk to my team about, and one is communications. 
No, we absolutely have to. We can't communicate enough uh, to bring people with us on a reform agenda. And coordination, which is another a slightly different take on collaboration. Um, but having said that, I'm really keen to get uh, questions uh, from people joining us today. I have another question um, which I'm actually going to ask our panellists to just really address very briefly so that we can start getting questions from you up on the screen. Now, I don't need to tell anybody here how competitive the labour market is at the moment and how oftentimes it's feeling like hunger games in terms of uh, recruiting and retaining staff. So the question that I have for you is how do we as the APS stay competitive and how do we continue to be an employee of employer of choice? How do you recommend teams look at attracting and retaining staff? Just a very quick response from each of you. Jody, why don't you go first? Yeah. We'll go that way. I will. Thank you. Um, look, we all know that the public service offers such a ver variety of uh, roles and there's excitement and there's a, a lot to do. And to me, telling our story and our narrative about that breadth of work that people can get involved is, is so critical. And the, probably the second, if I'm allowed to take more than one second, is, is having that flexibility, um, attracting staff in different locations is going to be really important. Um, that uh, the whole public sector is not in Canberra. And, and for my, for my uh, agency, we've got people all over Australia, uh, you know, from, from Brisbane to Broome to Bunbury, you know, so people are everywhere. Um, and we should, be, we should be drawing on the talent right across Australia. Uh, and making sure that they can be part of what is a really exciting agenda in the public service, but also they've got that flexibility, uh, they get support, they can move. Um, that mobility across the sector is so important as well. So there's, there's such, you know, to me there's a lot of the... I had um, about uh, Tuesday, I had about 30 new graduates come in into our entry-level program. Huge um, uh, diversity among that group themselves in age and interest in the public sector, but they're there because they have really passionate and wanting to make a difference in the public sector. And I, I just think we need to hone that and really uh, tell our story about what is that diversity we have, what is the exciting things we get to do, and that uh, attract people through through that story. Thank you. Ray? We've got a great story. Be proud to tell it. Thank you. Um, think about different ways of working uh, that might uh, attract people who are interested in different ways of working. Uh, the work we're doing on the in-house consulting model so that we don't uh, contract out um, some of these really interesting projects, uh, I think is a good example of that. Thank you. Yeah, the panel's absolutely right about the um, sense of purpose and our employee value proposition. That, that's pretty fundamental. We need to do better at telling, telling that story. But also in terms of your teams as well, I'll be very quick. You've got to enable them and challenge them. You've got to make sure you push responsibility down so they're doing really interesting things. And then you've got to focus on their development. And again, it comes back to continuous learning. But my sense is that good leaders build very good teams and building a team around you is fundamental. Thank you, um, Peter. And maybe, Rachel, you didn't have the um, opportunity to look at the question behind, but your comment is uh, very relevant. <laughs> so the first question that we have here is, and, and the Minister obviously referenced this, there is a lot of talk about reducing reliance on contractors. So what are our plans for upskilling the APS to replace those hired for their specialist skill sets? And Rachel, maybe I'll just throw it straight to you on that one. Sure. So uh, the work we're doing is the Minister mentioned on the in-house consulting model. Ray's helping us with that as well. Um, we're really thinking about um, a couple of things. Uh, we're thinking about an in-house consultancy service, essentially inside the APS, uh, that can do three things. Uh, the first thing is actually doing those consulting projects um, for other APS agencies um, that have priorities that, that need to access the use of an in-house service, um, so providing those consultancy services. So. Yeah, the vision in my head, um, depending on you know what the minister, um, how the minister wants to take it forward, um, but you have a group of in-house consultants. They've got a toolkit 
Um, they take their toolkit out uh, kind of engagement by engagement across the service, wherever they're working, uh, coming together with people in the agencies that we're par they're partnering with to deliver projects um, and do some really interesting work. Um, so that's the delivery of the consulting services. Uh, the other component of it is actually working with the service um, to support um, people who might need to engage consultants for a good reason, um, but actually to extract more value out of how we work with consultants. Um, so along the lines of a consulting playbook, for example, that just helps um, all of us extract maximum value when we do need to legitimately use consultants. Um, the third thing, though, I think is really important, and it's an option uh, that we're developing up around capability. Um, so uh, when, you know, in-house consultants go out uh, engagement by engagement, they can deliver a fantastic project, um, but in my mind, wouldn't it be great if as well as delivering the project or, and the products, they also um, shared capability um, and part of the, the outcome of every engagement is a capability uplift, a sharing of capability or a connecting of capability from all of those capabilities uh, that exist across the service as well. So um, there's some thoughts uh, from the live work we're doing on that one. Thank you. I might ask Ray to also have a go at this question and then I'm going to move on so I'm not going to ask everybody to answer every question so we can get through many more questions. Um, look, I think, um, you know, building capability is... Again, it's not, a, it's not a quick thing. It, it, it takes a while to decay and it takes a while to build up again. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would hardly support what, what Rachel has said, um, but I'm also conscious that there'll be people uh, either in the audience or online going, yeah, but hang on, we, we are so flat strap. We, we just don't have time to do that. And I think what we've got to try and do is, is through our managers and our SES, ensure that we get um, people allowing themselves to have that time carved out to, to do this. Otherwise, we, we will just stay on the treadmill and we won't, uh, we won't get there. Thank you. Peter, you want to... Yeah, just to come in on that very quickly, I agree very much with what uh, Rachel and Ray have said, but there is a staged approach. So we're doing an order of employment, which is finance is doing that with the APSC, and essentially that's looking at where do we use consultants, how do we use them, how much we pay them, basically to get a baseline on our use of consultants. And obviously the government has made it very clear they're worried about the hollowing out of capability in the public service by an overuse of consultants and the need to get the balance right. The next step is a strategic framework for the use of, uh, of consultants, and that's something the APSC is working on with finance and with, with PM&C. And that, that'll look at guidance about what are the real core skills that the public service needs to attain? When would you properly use consultants? And then importantly, as the point Rachel was making, um, how do you make sure that you've got best practice in terms of your contracting with consultants? And how do you make sure there's an exchange of information and capability so that you're building your own capability as well? So it's not a short-term, there's no short-term fix here, but there's a really important piece of work that's going ahead. Thank you. I mean, I think that question had two parts to it. One was the consultancy element to it and the other um, related, but also has a slightly different take, is the specialist skills part of the question. Um, and I know from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, we've been doing a bit of thinking about capability over the next 10 years and, and having a think about what that looks like. And, and people we're consulting external to government are looking for us to have more capability in whole areas that we just haven't needed to necessarily, um, but the world, the way that it's changing, is requiring us to. So to give you examples, uh, more capability in space, uh, AI, uh, cyber, of course, which is less new, uh, but it's these sorts of different skills that actually, for good reasons, we don't necessarily have now at the level that we're going to need in the future, we need to be able to also anticipate that. But I'm going to ask you the next question, Jodie, if that's OK. And it's not an easy one. But you wouldn't expect easy. Um, the robo-debt Royal Commission has raised significant cultural issues in the APS. How can the APS support secretaries to drive change? Um, so I think it goes to the reform and particularly around integrity and I think to, to Ray's point around uh, courage being one of those things we need to have is actually being able to stand up and, and say when something is, is wrong. So I think it's really important that there's some lessons in there that we can all take on board. 
Um, and uh, the integrity piece in the reform, I think, will pick up some of that. But we've all got that responsibility as public servants uh, to give to give that fair and frank uh, advice, fearless and frank advice as well. Can I ask if any of the panels want to jump in on this question before I just ask you to, Ray? Um, I I probably can't because I'm oh, yes. I'm going okay. to appear so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Peter, this sounds like one for you. Yeah. No. Look. I mean, Obviously, the, um, we're waiting on, on, on the interim report from the Royal Commission, and we can't get ahead of that, and I've got to be very careful what I say. But clearly, there have been some issues thrown up around uh, culture and, uh, and, and how organisations work and leadership. There have been issues thrown up around how you handle draft legal advice. There have been issues thrown up about note-taking and record-keeping. There's been a whole suite of issues that have come out of that which we will need to think seriously about. So um, PMNC, APSC and Attorney General's Department have established a task force to start working through some of these issues. But obviously, we have to wait till we, we receive the, uh, the interim report from the Royal Commission and their final report. And uh, I can't get ahead of myself on that. Thanks, Peter. Do we have some more questions? Conscious of time. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Could a four-day working week contribute to workspace? That says workspace, diversity, efficiencies, and retention. Go on, Peter, you grabbed your mic, so... <laughs> um, yeah. um, did it in France. Um, look, um, we are... The whole issue of flexible work is a really important, a really important uh, one. Uh, in fact, I was um, at a workforce summit, a uh, panel on workforce summit yesterday, which the AFR... Um, ran in Sydney, and a part of the discussion was around flexible work because the private sectors, private sectors grappling with that, as is, as is all public sectors are grappling with it. Um, COVID showed it was possible to work from home; that the technology can stand up. Um, we've looked hard at productivity, um, but there are other issues as well, and we are in competition with the private sector, so obviously that's something we're having to sort of tune into very, very closely. We've always been pretty good uh, regarding sort of flexible working arrangements uh, in, in the past, but the private sector has moved uh, uh, quite quick, has moved very quickly in this because of COVID. What uh, Secretary's Board is doing at the moment is considering what you might call fl um, principles around flexible work. So. Obviously, agency heads know their business, and if you think about the diversity of the public service, you know you have the future fund, you have productivity at one end, then you have um, people who have to deal with people at the front line, whether it be border force or centre link. So we leave it to agency heads; they know their business, but they manage their business. But we do want to set up some general principles around how should flexible work be managed in the system, and one of them obviously is. Uh, employee value proposition and to be competitive in the, in, in the marketplace and what people want, and they do want flexibility. And flexibility makes a lot of sense, for, you know, for, um, particularly in terms of gender, uh, for managing families, managing aging parents, whatever the issue might be. And flexibility is much wider than just four days a week or three days a week. You think of all the different ways you can do flexibility, and that's pretty fundamental. That's part of our principles. But core will also be mutual benefit. So it's got to work not only for you as an individual, but it's got to work for your team as well in terms of you have obligations as an employee to deliver for the government and to, to deliver for the Australian people. So it's got to work for your team as well as for yourself. So mutual benefit, I suspect, be one of those fundamental principles that that secretary will work through on this. But it's a complex issue. Um, but in the end, it'll be agency heads who have to manage their workforces because they know their workforces but we are looking at what general principles uh, would look like. Uh, and uh, as I say, this is something that obviously um, um, we would look to do fairly quickly. Thanks, Peter. I've got, I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Um, and that question is, how do we be a model employer for neurodivergent staff and avoid recruitment practices that overvalue writing job applications and answering interview questions in precise ways. I wonder whether either of our two secretaries looking after big organisations have a perspective on, on that. Well, I wouldn't confine it to simply neurodivergent. I, I, I think um, we have to 
Yeah, our recruitment practices are, are pretty, are pretty historic. Pretty historic, <laughs> some ways. I was going to say archaic. My, my, coo's, my coo's been urging me to say something incendiary over uh, uh, the course, of it, which I've resisted to date. Um, but I, I think our, I mean, you know, our practices are um, are, are not. Um, universal in their approach and they need to be and, and it's it's like the design of our workplaces we need to seriously embrace universal design and that's going to take time and cost money and all those things but if we're serious about uh, maximizing the talent that is out there and there's massive talent uh, in that manifests in different ways to the the very stereotypical way that we envisage uh, the archetypal public servant to be that's the first step is acknowledging that that, that exists and we have a we have a target. We all know we have a target for, um, um, you know, uh, for diverse, uh, for disability. Um, but I, I really think acknowledging that there are different ways of doing business and then starting to do that and think as, things as simple as uh, before an interview, uh, giving the applicants the questions 15 minutes beforehand so they can have a think about it. That's good practice, um, and for some people. It works, uh, it really helps them. For other people, they don't want to know, they actually put it away uh, because they'd rather take it on the fly. So I, I just think we need to have uh, flexible approaches, uh, don't get locked into you know, a, a statement of claims um, and, and you know, work, your, work your field. You know, you, you, in, in some cases, ad adapt the process within the, within the bounds of what we can do but adapt it based on the, the, the sort of candidates you've got in front of you. Thank you, Jodie. Yeah, look, there's a, obviously a, a lot of barriers um, through in our recruitment practices, right through from the way that we advertise, uh, right through to the interview and then the selection uh, process after that as well, um, that, that are barriers to a whole range of people. And I think we've got to be really flexible about how we, how we address that and uh, Clearly there's, uh, for, for my agency, we've, we've got uh, a lot of First Nations staff from right across the country. So, uh, and they will have varying degrees that, um, of uh, ability to address some of the things that might be in, a, in your normal sort of, here's, here's your job description, write a, write, write a job application and come through this really horrendous process and we might give you a job at the end of that. Um, and I, I think uh, we've got a, really look at what's the what's the real skills we need here and value the different skills and the life experiences of people, but also respect that in the way that we recruit people um, so that it, it isn't seen as a, a barrier to them even coming in the door, uh, which is, I think, at the moment, a really big um, problem for us, given that we do have this 5% target for First Nations. Uh, but it's a barrier across the board in other diverse groups as well, as, is, as, as the question um, goes to as well and I think we've got to really look at doing that differently um, and uh, still getting the, the best person for the job but there, there's different ways of, of uh, making sure people are comfortable through that process um, and uh, uh, it's just an area that I'm, I'm really passionate about because I think so much of our process stops people coming in the door. Yeah, we had somebody come and address us at the coup committee yesterday who spoke from Parks Australia who was talking about going out to recruit rangers mm -hmm. for national parks and actually actually going out, meeting people on country, talking to elders, recruiting mm -hmm. that way, and not putting out job applicate, you know, advertising in the usual way through APS jobs. Nothing against APS jobs, Peter, um, but you know, actually, really working with people, yeah. not. Yeah, and I think that not necessarily a tap on the shoulder in that way, but just letting people know per that personal approach does make a huge difference. And in fact, one of my staff. Um, Michael, whose name is, funnily enough. <laughs> he's, I don't, I'm not sure how old he is, but he, he, he's, he wasn't thinking about moving, but someone actually said, well, what do you think about such and such a job? And, and then was sort of, you know, brought in through that process and um, sort of it, it, almost a, a, not, not a buddy system, but a, a bit more support through the process as well. And I think that's, um, you know, really critical as well. You, you, you just can't feel that it's just this... this uh, the barriers are so high that you're not going to get those people through because they'll they'll actually get. I, think I applied for a job in the public Australian public sector several years ago, and the process just got so much. <laughs> I just abandoned the whole thing. 
<laughs> on, on the day of the interview. It's like, no, it's, all, it's just too much. So it, it, it does affect all of us in different ways. Um, more recently, I was more successful and stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's so funny. We had a conversation in DFAT the other day and, and a few of the deputy secretaries shared that they had attempted to get into the public service through a graduate program or cadetship or whatever it was back in the day, uh, totally unsuccessfully. Um, but nonetheless managed to mm. have a successful career in the public <laughs> service. Uh, I'm going to um, not take any more questions, but Rachel or Peter, if you wanted to jump in on this one, you'd be welcome to. Otherwise, I'll um, call the um, panel to a close. Maybe just the other thing to call out uh, is that the Chief Operating Officer Committee that I mentioned um, are doing some thinking and doing some work on uh, how do we um, still retain the merit principle, which is really, really important, um, appointments on merit, going back to integrity, you know, it's all part of that same picture. But how do we also, alongside merit, be agile and also embrace all of the different types of merit that, that we know that we have and can continue to bring in to the public service? So uh, there's a really good piece of work there um, that I think will have a lot of application going forward. Thank you. No, I'd just say I agree with Rachel and I'd also like to just re-emphasise the fundamental principle of merit in the public service, that is core to who we are and what we do. Thank you. Um, okay, can I thank everybody who participated in today's session? Um, I really enjoyed myself. I thank my fellow panellists uh, for their insights, uh, for some great questions. I'm sure there's quite a few other questions we didn't get to, but we will capture those and make sure that we uh, feed in the sentiments of those questions into the ongoing roadshow around the country. Um, now, I don't know whether... I should have got my notes here. ..whether we're going to look at any more of the picture. Are we, Debbie? Yep. There it is. Hey, that's fantastic. Look at that. What do you reckon, Peter, Jody, Ray, Rachel, what do you reckon? Good luck. Like that's fantastic. <laughs> that's pretty good. Very good. Uncle Wally? That's a good one from you. You might. <laughs> that's really great. Thank you very much for that. Thank you all very much. That's it. We're just going to wait a few minutes so that you can finish what you're doing, but thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.